Hello, hello, Mordimers here and welcome to another incredible game of Adolf Andersen. This time the game is called Evergreen Game and it was played in Berlin in 1852. Um, the story behind this game is also uh, quite interesting and following Andersen's death in 1879, Wilhelm Steinitz published a tribute uh, in the Field magazine and he published Andersen two most famous games. Of course, the Immortal game and the link is over there. So if you are interested, it's also very incredible game. Check it out. And this game, Evergreen game. And why it's Evergreen game? Annotating the famous move 19, Rook A to D1, which I'm gonna, you know, show you why it's so important move, Steinitz wrote, an evergreen in the laurel crown of the departed chess hero. And from that time, it became the name of this incredible game. So that's the story behind this. And, you know, Wilhelm Steinitz couldn't predict how how good the name evergreen game uh, gonna become in the um, in the future because uh, from that time this game was started to be analyzed by many many people analysis and then you know uh, great chess players and the last big contribution was given by gary kasparov in 2003 so so this is really uh, impressive how evergreen this game is uh, okay let's jump to the introduction of the players so we have Adolf Andersen German player um, 32 years old um, and he play as white he's ranking 2580 according to Edo historical chess rating and chessmetrics.com I had to make you know uh, some estimation uh, but he was uh, one of the strongest player at that era and of course, by many people, he was the first unofficial uh, world chess champion as his results in the tournaments were just phenomenal. He won the tournament in 1851 uh, in London International, first international tournament. Uh, then he won another tournament in London 1862. So he definitely was number one in that era. And his opponent, Jean Dufresne, uh, 23 years old, also German player uh, from Berlin with, uh, you know, French sounding um, last name. Uh, he's ranking 2473. Um, so definitely not as strong as Andersen, but still, uh, you know, he was in the top 20 of the players at that time. So without further to do let's see what happened on the board we have e4 by Andersen and e5 by Duvresne knight f3 knight c6 bishop c4 bishop c5 and b4 so a very famous Evans gambit and among the uh, king's gambit it was um, the most popular opening in the 19th century I think uh, very romantic uh, white actually sacrificed one or two pawns uh, for the rapid development so we have bishop on b4 c3 kicking the bishop bishop a5 and now d4 uh, we have e takes on d4 now this pawn can't capture because of course um, there is the pin on the king so we have the the castle and here black has couple of options knight g on e7 is the most popular supporting d5 and black also would have the rapid development um, d6 is quite strong knight on f6 is possible but here we have d3 it's Dufresne defense as the Dufresne you know played the most frequently the idea here is that this knight from b1 can't jump on c3 easily as the pawn on c3 gonna of course stay here for a while we have queen on b3 with attack on f7 queen f6 defending and e5 attacking the queen and now this pawn is defended only once can it be taken uh, if it's taken then we would have rook on e1 and d6 defending the problem is it looks everything okay uh, because this knight can't be attacked by pawn but then we have bishop on g5 very dangerous and now if queen goes on g6 we would have knight on e5 d, d takes on e5 and the rook attacks the king and the bishop so that's not possible queen on f5 is even worse but it's not so obvious why knight on e5 d on e5 and now queen on b5 
attacking the king and the bishop but not this is not the point after c on c6 rook on e5 is very strong now attacking the king and the queen so queen gonna be lost uh, but it's actually possible to play bishop on e6 this, this would be the strongest move uh, so the queen is still under attack a uh, queen on b7 and now it's a disaster for black so so this have to be fine yes the the rook can be taken but then queen on c6 uh, attack on the king this bishop makes you know a really wonderful job here uh, if bishop on d7 then there is a checkmate in four moves so king on f8 but still queen on a8 um, and black has to sacrifice you know um, defending the minor pieces a queen on c8 queen on e8 and white can exchange or can simply pick up another minor piece and win the game so this is why it's not possible to play a uh, queen on g6 of course has to be played and now we have rook on e1 rook on d1 is mo most popular now uh, but rook on e1 was played and um, it's pretty natural move as d1 is usually you know for the for another rook and um, attacking in the center we have knight g on e7 preparing d5 to you know develop the rest of the pieces and now we have bishop on a3 uh, it's kind of preventing this this move um, d5 but not really because that that's actually would be the best move d5 if, if it was played uh, e takes on d6 c takes on d6 uh, knight b on d2 and then after castle the game would continue rook on e3 of course these pawns are very very weak so probably would fall but black stands uh, slightly better because they are you know uh, two pawns up so even if losing this this pawns then then there is still okay uh, so black has some moves you know to develop the pieces and be more active in this game uh, however d5 was not played uh, Dufresne told okay uh, maybe I can't play this is not the strongest move b5 maybe I'm gonna you know uh, develop this way uh, you know activate my rook that is uh, looks like a cool plan Anderson takes on b5 and now we have rook on b8 as planned a uh, queen on a4 and now uh, castle is impossible it looks very natural but after uh, after castle look at this knight this knight protecting you know uh, two pieces so overwork uh, white would just win the piece and then pick up another piece after so that's unplayable this is why bishop on b6 first and now um, the castle is possible so knight b on d2 and here for some reason um, Dufresne didn't castle that that was the you know the most obvious and natural move but he first developed the bishop on b7 we have knight on e4 and here another move uh, castle is not really great here because now after castle bishop on d3 and it's a lot of threats here now this knight can jump with the attack on the queen and the check uh, and then if the if the king is moved on h Eight, then this knight can jump on c5 so now the queen is under attack the bishop is defended and there is also another threat of forking a uh, really unpleasant uh, situation so better here to play something like you know d2 and then white have to move back and then black have time to consolidate the position however the black position is not not really great but queen on f5 uh th this is the final mistake i think queen on f5 doesn't make much sense we have bishop on d3 and now this queen is you know in a big trouble so another move by queen so this queen move you know twice and black didn't you know secure the king yet so that's the problem and here feel free to pause the video and find the winning sequence for white if you are the beginner just find the idea what to do if you are a little bit more advanced player just find you know the the final sequence uh, while i enjoy my cup of tea
So if you know this game, probably you think knight on f6 is the strongest move and it was indeed played by Adolf Andersen. However, he was criticized that this is not really the best uh, move. The idea is to catch this queen. Sometimes if you see the queen, you know, dancing in front of your king, it's possible to catch that queen and this is the case. So now a knight on g6 win much easier. Now let's see the squares which are controlled by white. So this knight of course controls these squares, this knight here, the queen controls um, all of these squares, this bishop controls more, this pawn controls more, um, this pawn of course is defended. What to do? The queen has only two squares around um, to play. Uh, not easy task. So queen on h6, the only move, but now bishop on c1, harassing the queen, queen on e6, but now bishop on c4. So let's check our net. Uh, we have pawn controlling these squares, um, the knights, the bishop, and of course this bishop attack the queen. Not much left, only two squares. Now, if queen moves to g4, this is discovered attack we check so queen would be lost and now if queen moves to g6 then knight h4 and the queen is lost so knight on d5 is the only move and now knight on g5 with attack on the queen queen can move to g4 uh, and now rook on e4 and the queen is trapped, nothing can be done. Knight on c3 with attack on the queen would be possible, but then just exchange the pieces. Bishop f7 with check, king d8, now rook g4, knight on e4, rook a4 and white won the piece and the game. So this is the safest way to victory. However, in this position, uh, Adolf Andersen didn't play the safest way. He played knight on f6, forking the king and the queen. So of course, the, um, this sacrifice has to be accepted. And now we have rook on g8. And the idea behind this is, of course, picking up the knight, what would be very, very dangerous. And after picking up the knight, this, this move is possible. And then some mating ideas with two uh, bishops. Very dangerous situation for white. So white should do something about that. Now this is the move which was commented for you know 150 years. Rook A on D1 and this move created the evergreen game. So remember that move. Now this is you know a very very subtle trap. Black captures a knight and now we have rook on e7 with check and here Dufresne play knight on e7. And actually feel free to pause the video because this is puzzles where white give the force checkmate in four moves. While I enjoy my cup of tea. Okay, ready? So... If white don't do anything about that, there is checkmate in one move, so uh, white have to have force mate with the checks, the best, okay? Queen on d7, check. This is the only move playable. And now if king goes on f8, then we would have checkmate on e7. So king has to take on d7. And now bishop on f5, bank, double check. Now you have double check, so king has to move. If king goes to c6, we would have checkmate on d7. So the king on e8. And now bishop on d7 with check. And now king, wherever goes f8, we, we have the bishop on e7 checkmate. Very beautiful checkmate with two bishops and uh, really wonderful. It's, it's on the edge. And look at this. This is almost checkmate uh, too wide. But this is not why this game is the evergreen game. I will show you why this is a really evergreen game. Uh, in this position, rook a on d1. Adolf Andersen was criticized for this move. And many said, for example, Emmanuel Lasker later, he said bishop on e4 was the winning move. And then he showed, okay, after queen on h3, that makes sense. We have checkmate coming. So g3, but now rook on g3, 
Uh, and after picking up queen on g3, of course, we have the bishops. These bishops are very dangerous, so keep in mind. King h1. And now bishop f2. And Emmanuel Lasker in his common sense in chess in 1895, uh, he wrote rook on e2 and that's winning for white. So don't need to analyze more. However, he was wrong because knight d4 is coming. And what to do now? Uh, this knight can't take because the checkmate is coming on h3. Queen has to take on d4. Uh, and that's of course losing because it's losing the queen. If c takes on d4, it doesn't help. Bishop on e4 uh, is even stronger. And if rook takes on e4, then black simply pick up the knight on f3 with check. And then after, uh, you know, g3, h3, it's checkmate. So uh, rook on f2, but it also doesn't help. Queen f2, and now the attack on f3. The only way to stop it is queen on d1, losing the queen. And actually, it's a checkmate um, in four, so uh, it doesn't much matter. However, after bishop on f2, Lasker continuation is not the strongest, not rook on e2. Now, Jacob Murray in 1975, and it was confirmed later by Zaitsev and also Gary Kasparov. So yes, Gary Kasparov analyzed this uh, quite intensively. Uh, bishop on e7, this, they found this move as the strongest in the position. And after queen on h3, which looks pretty serious, knight on h2. Bishop e1, rook on e1, queen on h4, and now queen on d1, and white are quite okay here. We have knight on e7, now bishop on b7, and of course queen on f6. And now this position, it's maybe slightly better for white, but try to win that. You have the bishop for three pawns. Uh, your king doesn't have much, you know, uh, protection. So yes, you can play bishop g2, rook b2. And it's not really clear how you win uh, as white, but that's the best what could be played. By rook a on d1, he created, you know, the most analyzed position in the chess history. If you disagree, let me know in the comment, but I'm going to prove this was, you know, really, really analyzed uh, from this moment. So what happened next? In 1853, one year later, Staunton started to analyze the situation. Knight e5. What if black play knight e5? Of course, it's losing. So that's not the greatest. Maybe bishop on c5. And now uh, this bishop don't have, you know, any power on this diagonal. No, it's losing. So uh, maybe other moves, maybe d6. Uh, actually, it's also losing. So uh, how about rook on g2? And he analyzed Mm, actually, no, it's also losing. So how about other moves? Queen on h3. No, it's other also losing. And he created the article. And for many years, you know, the players accepted that, uh, okay, that's, that's actually losing. So this position after rook a on d1 is winning for white. However, 45 years later, uh, Lipke from Germany, he asked, okay, but what about rook on g4? It's pretty interesting move. How about this one? And, you know, people started to analyze again. And he showed this way. Bishop on c4, you know, protecting the queen. And now queen on f5. Rook on d7. This is incredible move. But look now, king on d7. Now he showed knight on e5 attacking this king and attacking the the rook now king on c8 because um, obviously it can't be taken and also it can be taken because of the pin so king on c8 and now knight on g4 looks good so far yeah knight on d5 now and now queen d1 this is the move very very dangerous move now rook on a8 is coming so knight on d8 and now continuation rook on e5 with attack on the queen but then bishop on f2 with check first 
uh, and if if the bishop is taken then white lose the rook so uh, not an option king h1 but now knight on f4 the situation is so crazy and complicated and look at this this is checkmating net so white has to do something h3 and now there are two continuations uh knight on g2 and now if the queen is taken then of course we have discovered check and and picking up the queen and uh, that's the one of the option or queen on b1 this one is crazy and if the queen is taken then we would have you know check on g1 and after moving then rook would go to the first rank so this is pretty crazy line isn't it but it's not the end because in 1930 that means you know another 32 years uh, later uh, actually hoppe and hacker uh, said hey but why should we play rook on e5 that is a so complicated line how about just bishop on d3 attacking the queen and now white stands really good and winning the game uh okay correct so this line also is winning for white correct but then kasparov in 2003 you know gary kasparov said hey guys why to make all the things so complicated why not knight on f6 knight on f6 in the and the position is equal now it's playable for both sides so uh, how about this one can you imagine that so uh, all we know after rook on g4 uh, the final standing is the position is unclear but probably black can defend um, that game uh, as, as the position is you know nearly equal but that's not the end another move which was you know uh, analyzed is rook takes on g2 and most of the analysis you know try to go for this it looks better for white but it's not clear how to win the end game king on g2 and then knight on e5 it's also a pretty complicated line now queen on d7 very similar king on d7 and now bishop on g6 picking up the queen king on e6 and now bishop on h5 then rook on g8 and it would be a draw uh, if the king is moved but actually white can play king on h3 which is uh, much stronger and then knight on g6 as knight was under attack then bishop on g4 and exchanging some pieces king f6 uh, knight on e5 knight on e5 and now bishop on e7 forcing black to to take that bishop uh, and after rook on e5 king on f6 and white stand better because of the of the exchange you know they are up the exchange but these bishops are are pretty you know um active so it would not be so easy for white you know to win this game but probably is winning and uh, that's the final analysis of this um you know uh, rook on g2 but that's not the end of course this is why this is a very green game uh, in 1958 the readers of Schach Echo that is a German newspaper found two continuations so if we go back to that situation what about Queen on h3 this was you know analyzed by Staunton and he said okay this is uh, losing for black black can do anything but after Bishop on f1 uh, black queen f5 and what white can do black just stand on this diagonal and white actually has nothing because uh, as long as d7 is, is protected then uh, there is nothing can do so all white can do you know is uh, follow the queen and that would be the threefold repetition so that is the one option but also they found totally new continuation uh, and that's uh, bishop on d4 this was not analyzed before and this is also very very interesting now c takes on d4 obviously and then queen on f3 actually can be taken now why because this pawn is on d4 now so this rook cannot you know look at d7 and all of this you know um, tactic doesn't work so um, now for example bishop on e4 but now rook on g2 it looks pretty dangerous king on h3 
one uh, rook on h2 king h2 queen f2 and okay i don't want to show all the lines but there are another crazy lines at least two lines with king h1 and king h2 two different crazy lines both of them uh looks like very drawish if you are interested follow yourself i already have headache of evergreen game and uh, and you know actually my advice if you really enjoy this game go to this position feel free to post the video and you know you can post this video for for the hours for the days weeks or even years and and i'm not sure if you can find you know the final solution this was tried to 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 be found for many years you know 150 years you know, from Howard Staunton, 1953, the first analysis until Gary Kasparov in 2003 is 150 years. And the final solution is, is not found. Probably Black can't defend that game. Okay, that's all. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, press like. If you don't like this video, and now I can understand maybe you don't like this video, press unlike. Leave the comment because this game is really crazy and it deserves the comments. What do you think about that? Maybe you have some other ideas. Uh, and of course, if you don't want to miss any more interesting games, subscribe, click the bell button and Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.